president's foreign policy, in my opinion, is formed in part by a perception he has that his magnetism and his charm and his persuasiveness is so compelling that he can sit down with people like Putin and Chavez and, and Ahmadinejad and, and that they'll find we're such wonderful people that they'll go along with us and, uh, and that they'll stop doing bad things. And, and it's an extraordinarily naive uh, perception and it has led to uh, uh, huge errors in, in North Korea, in, in Iraq, uh, obviously in Iran, in Egypt, uh, around the world. Um, my own view is that, that the centerpiece of American foreign policy has to be strength. Everything I do will be calculated to increasing America's strength. When you stand by your allies, you increase your strength. When you attack your allies, you become weaker. When you stand by your principles, you get stronger. When you have a big military that's bigger than anyone else's, you're strong. I want to, when you have a strong economy, you build American strength. For me, everything is about strength. And, and communicating to people what is and is not acceptable. Uh, it's speaking softly but carrying a very, very, very big stick. And this president instead speaks loudly and carries a tiny stick. And, and that, that is, uh, you know, that, that's not the right course for a foreign policy. I, I saw Dr. Kissinger in, in New York. You're not eating. <laughs> I'm mesmerized. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's for the tears. <laughs> I saw Dr. Kissinger. I said to him, uh, uh, how are we perceived around the world? And he said, one word, weak. <laughs> uh, we are weak. And, uh, and that's how this president is perceived, uh, by our friends and, 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 uh, and unfortunately, by our foes. And, and it's, it's, no, it's no wonder that people like Kim Jong-un, uh, the new leader of North Korea, announces a long-range missile test only a week after he said he wouldn't. Uh, because it's like, what's this president going to do about it? Uh, you know, if you can't, if you can't act, why don't, don't threaten Please. Just to follow on in your act. I'm going to taste this, by the way. Yes, yeah, I just want to show you how it's done. You take this in your form. <laughs> Put it in. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to play this. Go ahead. You call this president you have hostage. Ronald Reagan was able to make a statement even before he became, was actually sworn in. Yeah. The hospitals were be On the day of his inauguration. Right. Yeah. So my question is really, how can we sort of duplicate that scenario? Oh. I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you how do I duplicate that scenario? I think it had to do with the fact that the Iranians perceived Reagan to do something to really get them out. Yeah. In other words, the people have the strength, and that's why I'm following on what the city about strength. Yeah. And that's why I'm suggesting that some something that you say over the next few months gets the Iranians to understand that their pursuit of a bomb is something that, that you would predict. And I think that that's something that, that could possibly resonate very well with the American public. I, I appreciate the idea. I, I, I can't, one of the things that's frustrating to me is that um, in a typical day like this, when I do three or four events like this, the number of foreign policy questions I get are between zero and one. And the American people are not, are not concentrated at all upon China, on Russia, Iran, Iraq. This president's failure to put in place a status of forces agreement allowing 10 to 20,000 troops to stay in Iraq, unthinkable. And, and yet, in, in that election, in the Jimmy Carter election, the, the fact that we had hostages in, in, in Iran, I mean, that was all we talked about. And we had the two helicopters crash in the desert. I mean, that's, that, that, was, that was the focus. And so him solving that made all the difference in the world. I'm afraid today, if you said we got to run to agree to stand down and use your weapon, they go, you know, hold on. It's, it's really a, I don't know how much, but by the way, if, if something of that nature uh, presents itself, I, I will work to find a way to take advantage of the opportunity. Please. Yes. Such that's your lucky night. More foreign policy. <laughs> <laughs> You're um, married. <laughs> uh, we did, actually, the first time you were in Jerusalem, and we appreciate you being there. How do you think that the Palestinian problem can be solved and what do you think about it? Um, I, I'm torn by two perspectives in this regard. 
One is the one which I've had for some time, which is that the Palestinians have no interest whatsoever in establishing peace, uh, and that the and that the uh, uh, the pathway to peace is um, almost unthinkable to to accomplish. Now, why do I say that? Some might say, well, just let the Palestinians have the West Bank and, and have security and and, uh, uh, and, and set up a, a separate nation for the Palestinians. And then, and then come a couple of thorny questions. And I, I don't have a map here to look at the geography, but but uh, the border between Israel and the West Bank is obviously you're right there, right next to, to Tel Aviv, which is the, the financial capital, the industrial capital of Israel, the center of Israel. It's uh, what the border would be, maybe seven miles from Tel Aviv to what would be the West Bank. Nine, Nine miles. Okay, I came close. Nine miles. Um, the challenge is the other side don't of the West Bank. Don't go head to head. Yeah. <laughs> the other side of the West Bank, the other side of what would be this new Palestinian state would either be Syria at one point or, or Jordan. And, and of course the Iranians would want to do through the West Bank exactly what they did through Lebanon, what they did uh, in, in the Gaza, which is the Iranians would want to bring missiles and armament into the West Bank and potentially threaten Israel. So Israel, of course, would have to say, that can't happen. We've got to keep the Iranians from bringing weaponry into the West Bank. Well, that means that who? The Israelis are going are gonna, to uh, uh, patrol the border between Jordan, Syria, and, and this new Palestinian nation? Well, the Palestinians would say, oh, no way. We're an independent country. You can't, you can't you know, guard our border with other Arab nations. Uh, and then how about the import? How about flying into this Palestinian nation? Um, are we going to allow uh, military aircraft to come in? And, and weaponry to come in? And if not, who's going to keep it from coming in? Well, the Israelis. Well, uh, the Palestinians are going to say, we're not an independent nation if Israel is able to come in and tell us what can land at our airport. These are problems that are very hard to solve. All right? and, and I look at the Palestinians not wanting to see peace anyway, for political purposes, uh, committed to the destruction and elimination of Israel and these thorny issues, thorny issues, and I say, there's just no way. And so what you do is you say you, you move things along the best way you can. You hope for some degree of stability, but you recognize this is going to remain an unsolved uh, problem. I mean, we, we live with that in, in China and Taiwan. All right, we have, we have a, a, a potentially uh, volatile situation, but we sort of live with it. And we kick the ball down the field and hope that ultimately somehow something will happen and resolve it. We don't, we don't go to war to, to try and uh, resolve it imminently. Uh, on the other hand, I got a call from a former Secretary of State. I won't mention which one it was. Um, uh, but this individual said to me, uh, uh, you know, I think there's a prospect for, for uh, a settlement between the Palestinians and the Israelis uh, after the Palestinian elections. I said, really? And... Uh, you know, his answer was, was yes. Uh, I think there's some prospect, and I and I didn't uh, delve into it. But you know, I always keep open. I mean, I always keep open the idea. But I, I have to tell you, the idea of pushing on the Israelis to give something up, to give the Palestinians to get the Palestinians to act, is the worst idea in the world. We have done that time and time and time again. It does not work. So, so the, the, the only answer is show strength again, American strength, American resolve. And if the Palestinians someday reach a point where they want peace more than we're trying to put, force peace on them, then it's worth having the discussions. But until then, it's just uh, it's a wishful thing. You know, Please, you guys yeah. sit down. So I, I mean, don't you notice know afterwards? Please, don't you want to take like 12 miles from that slot. Now it's my mouth. The individuals in this room obviously are your supporters. I am very concerned about. The average American who doesn't know you, uh, there is a, a terrible misconception, and I spent numerous hours trying to, I hate being a defender when you are such a deserving individual. Years and years ago, uh, I called George Bush Sr., and he had helped me in my campaign in Massachusetts when I ran for Senate. I told him that there is a guy named Clinton who's going to meet him for the following reasons, and he laughed. Right now, I'm very concerned. Women 
do not want to give vote for you. Uh, Hispanics, majority of them do not want to vote for you. College students don't. Uh, after talking to them and explaining and rationalizing on a one-on-one -on -one basis, we are able to change their opinions. But on a mass level, how, how, what do you want us to do, this group here, as your emissaries, going out to convert these individuals to someone who's obviously going to be such an incredible asset to, to this country? Do you want you? Well, what do we do? Just have, tell us how some, we can help. I got some good news for you. It's not impossible. And the reason I say that is, for instance, the New York Times had a poll last week, New York Times and NBC, and I was leading by two points among women. All right, now the president came out and said this is an outrageous poll, they don't know what they're doing, but by the way, the polls at this stage make no difference at all. But the point is, women are, are open to supporting me, they like the president perfectly, but they're disappointed. They're disappointed with the jobs they're seeing with their kids, they're disappointed with their own economic uh, uh, standing right now. So we, we, can, we can capture uh, women's work. We're having a much harder time with Hispanic voters. And, and if the Hispanic voting bloc uh, be, becomes as committed to the Democrats as the African American voting bloc has in, in the past, why we're, we're in trouble as a party and I think as a nation. Rubio! Exactly. And, uh, exactly. Hey, come on! Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Don't do it. And so on. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, you were here. He came here early, <laughs> so we missed the uh, yeah, yeah. In, in every stump speech I give, I, I speak about the, uh, the fact that people who dream and achieve enormous success do not make us poorer, they make us better off. And the Republican audience that I typically speak to are blocked. I said that tonight. And the media is there. And they, they write about it. They say that Romney defends success, success in America and dreamers and so forth. So they write about it. But in terms of what gets through to the American consciousness, um, uh, that's, I have very little influence on that at this stage as to what they write about. And uh, that will happen. We'll have three debates. We'll have a chance to talk about that in the debates. There will be ads which attack me. I will fire back in a way that describes uh, in the best way we can the fact that the theme of my speech is that I, I, wind, I wind up, and uh, you know, the ambassadors heard me today uh, several times, I wind up talking about how the thing which I find most disappointing in this president is his attack of, of one American against another Amer American, the, the, the division of America based on going after those that have been successful. And then I quote Marco Rubio. I tell in my speeches, I say, Marco Rubio, um, I, I can't remember that I said that at the, I don't know that I said that at the fundraising event earlier today, but I did when I was in, uh, 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 in where? Exactly. 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 <laughs> I just said, Senator Rubio says that, that when he grew up here, poor, that they looked at people that had a lot of wealth, and his parents never once said, we need some of what they have. They should give us some. Instead, they said, if we work hard and go to school, someday we might be able to have that. And that's... How much of that gets picked up? There's so many things that don't get picked up in a campaign uh, because people aren't watching yet. By the way, most people don't watch during the summer. I said we're going to go into a season here starting from the mid of June or almost with no attention paid. Then after Labor Day in September and October, that's when we get the fun. For the past three years, all everybody's been told is don't worry, we'll take care of you. Mm -hmm. How are you going to do it in two months before the elections to convince everybody you got to take care of yourself? Um, well, there are 47% of the people who will vote for the president no matter what. All right, there are 47% who are with him, who are dependent upon government, who believe that, that they are victims, who believe that government has a responsibility to care for them, who believe that they are entitled to health care, to food, to housing, to you name it. But that's it's an entitlement, and the government should give it to them. And they will vote for this president no matter what. And, and I mean, the president starts off with 48, 49, 40. He starts off with a huge number. Uh, these are people who pay no income tax. 47% of Americans pay no income tax. So our message of low taxes doesn't connect. And he'll be out there talking about tax cuts for the rich. I mean, that's what they sell every, every four years. And, uh, and so my job is not to worry about those people. I'll never convince them that they should take personal responsibility and care for their lives. What I have to do is convince the 5 to 10% in the center that are independent, that are thoughtful, that look at voting one way or the other, depending upon, in some cases, emotion, whether they like the guy or not, what, they, what it looks like. I mean, it's the, the, when you ask those people, I mean, we do all these polls. I find it amazing. We poll all these people to see where you stand in polls. But 45% of the people will vote for the Republican, and 48 or 49.